Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, with Roger Silverman again. Um, we're having a look at the second international, Marxism and the second international. You'll remember two weeks ago, uh, the comrade presented a session on the first international, described the, the struggles between Marx and the anarchists and how the um, international collapsed because of counter-revolutionary period that was entered at the time. So tonight we're looking at the second international, those struggles um, in the setting up of it, and then also why it collapsed and perhaps what lessons we can draw from it. Thank you very much, Roger, for joining us again. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, as um, Tina said, last week we uh, examined the um, the brief but spectacular history of the International Working Men's Association, the world's first workers international. History has seen many times the rise and fall of magnificent international organizations of the working class in harmony with the ebb and flow of the class struggle itself. On the eve of every great social explosion, as the workers have flexed their muscles for a renewed assault on capitalist rule, new political formations have come into existence. And as the tide ebbed, as the revolution receded and reaction set in, these have been dashed against the rocks of the counter-revolution and shattered. But not even the most terrible defeats or the most disorientating intervals in the struggle have yet succeeded in obliterating completely the traditions of scientific socialism. A thin line of conscious cadres, if only a tiny handful, isolated sometimes to a single country, have always survived, around whom mass parties came to be created once the tide turned and the old society uh, fell prey to crisis. The ideas of socialism and, of course, internationalism, were not foisted artificially on the workers by Marxists. They sprang out of the aspirations of the working class, thrown together without property and dependent for their survival on solidarity and struggle. The IWMA had been a worldwide ideological workshop in which all the rival ideas could be tested out in practice against the experiences of the workers, both in victory and in defeat. And as Engels had explained, the aim of the international had been, quote, to weld together into one huge army, the whole militant working class of Europe and America. And therefore, he went on, it could not set out from the principles laid down in the Communist Manifesto. In other words, it was a forum in which to debate the issues, a foundry in which to sharpen the political tools. Now, the IWMA itself was destroyed by the defeats of the Paris Commune, leaving the workers without a battle headquarters, an arena of debate, or a coordinating center serving their needs as an international class. But it is a stunning tribute to Marx and Engels that they had already won the argument. It took the defeat of the Paris Commune, but their brilliant analysis of its lessons was written in the collective name of the General Council. As Engels had predicted on the collapse of that body, I believe the next international will be directly communist and will proclaim precisely our principles. And so it proved, and sooner than could have been expected. The effectiveness of their work was proved by the fact that over the seven short years of existence of the IWMA, by the time it was forced to shut down, they had succeeded in establishing first principles. So once the tide had turned and newly emergent mass parties and trade unions had taken root, a new international was founded in 1889, and it stood under the banner of the ideas of the Communist Manifesto. So, at least nominally, on the ideas of scientific socialism, of Marxism. Now, what an achievement that was. Marx and Engels had succeeded almost single-handedly in establishing the authority of their method. Uh, sorry, one second. Uh, as the standpoint of the working class, uh, who today has heard of the social quacks with their universal panaceas, the Proudhons, the Madurings, the Lasalles, Bakunins, and Bronchies, and today, a century and a half later, how many millions around the world have at least dimly heard the name of Karl Marx? So with the feverish growth of 
capitalism and of the proletariat, great mass workers' parties were built during the 1870s and 1880s, mostly proclaiming themselves Marxists. In the 1870s, social democratic parties were established in Germany, Austria, Denmark, France, Holland, Hungary, Spain, Switzerland, and the USA. And then in the 1880s, in Belgium, Britain, Norway, Russia, and Sweden. When the founding Congress of the Second International was held in July 1889, they chose that as a, a symbolic date, deliberately chosen because it was the centenary of the French Revolution. And as Engels had predicted, it stood at least formally on the basis of Marxist ideas. Delegates representing fledgling workers' parties in 24 countries gathered in Paris together under a massive red banner carrying the slogan, Workers of the World Unite. 467 delegates were gathered there to hear its chair announce, quote, one of the greatest events in the history of the peoples. Marx's son-in-law, Paul Lafargue, welcomed them with the words, we gather here, not under the banner of the tricolor or any other national colors, we gather here under the banner of the red flag, the flag of the international proletariat. And when the new organization proclaimed May the 1st, 1890, as the occasion for a world one day general strike, that first act of the Socialist International opened a new era in world history. The ruling class was thrown into panic throughout Europe, and in many countries it met the strike with brutality. And on that momentous May Day, Engels celebrated with pride the triumphant consummation of the historic life work of himself and uh, Marx. And he wrote with pride, true, the international itself lived only nine years, but that the eternal union of the proletarians of all countries created by it is still alive and lives stronger than ever, there is no better witness than this day. Because today, as I write these lines, the European and American proletariat is reviewing its fighting forces, mobilized for the first time, mobilized as one army under one flag for one immediate aim. And today's spectacle will open the eyes of the capitalists and landlords of all countries to the fact that today, the working men of all countries are united indeed. And then he ended by saying, if only Marx was still by my side to see this with his own eyes. Engels, of course, could not have foreseen the betrayals and defeats that were still to come. Now, the new workers' parties that were now springing up in Europe gained enormous influence, and especially so in Germany. By 1905, the German Social Democratic Party already had 384,327 members. And by 1914, party membership had swelled to 1,085,905. In 1912, the SPD won 4.3 million votes out of 12.2 million, and it had over a million members with 2.5 million in affiliated trade unions. It offered workers not only a political voice, but also welfare and cultural services, including legal aid, social security advice, employment exchanges, drama productions, libraries, peripatetic teachers, choral societies, sports clubs, welfare clinics, holiday packages, rallies, festivals, training courses, a central school for workers' education, and a famous party school. It published a number of weekly and monthly periodicals, and even its own press agency. In fact, it published 91 newspapers with a total readership of 1.5 million. It ran successful Marxist education classes at party schools and trade union colleges, and it became a model for socialist parties throughout Europe. However, deep within it, the hidden cancer was already incipient even from the start. It was ominous that at the founding conference, the German section announced that it would only observe the May Day demonstration in the evening after working hours. And the British, that it would hold a march, but it would be on the first Sunday in May rather than strike on a working day. And more serious still, a few years later, was the dishonest treatment of Engels's famous introduction to Marx's class struggles in France, where he had made a brilliant analysis of the military and political changes in the tasks facing the proletariat since the days of barricades fighting in 1848. 
It was published, but with a key passage excluded, thus distorting the whole meaning of the article to justify the opportunist policies of uh, the right wing under Bernstein, who we're coming to in a moment. And from his deathbed, Engels protested that, quote, I am made to appear a Pacific worshipper of legality at any price. And he demanded a correction, quote, in order that this shameful impression be wiped out. But it was not actually until 1924 that the excluded passage was rediscovered. And it was to the credit of revolutionaries like Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg that they were not at all disorientated or blown off course by the use against them of such a gigantic authority as Engels. This monstrous fabrication, although it was a thousand times excelled since then by the scientists, in comparison with which Bernstein looks like a clumsy, clumsy amateur, but it was not the first of its kind. If uh, comrades uh, would um, go back a little further, Marx's own critique of the Gotha program, which corrected the mistakes in the draft program around which Germany's two socialist workers' parties were uniting, was itself suppressed for 16 years from 1875 to 1891. So throughout a protracted period of economic upswing, strong reformist tendencies developed around the labor bureaucracy, crystallizing in the new imperialist epoch. It was a period similar in its corrosive effects on the political level of the labor movement to the decades following the Second World War, from which we have at last emerged in the recent period. The reformist ideas of Bernstein, of the British Fabians, of Milleron in France, the first socialists to enter a bourgeois cabinet, were eventually to culminate in the great betrayal of 1914, though such a catastrophic nightmare outcome was utterly unthinkable to everyone at the time. The first prophet of reformism, Bernstein, pioneered the term revisionism, opposing the idea that the lot of workers under capitalism was deteriorating and that capitalism was heading for a catastrophic collapse. And he argued that the party should be a democratic socialist party of reform. The so-called party center led by Kautsky held up their hands in horror. Formally, they upheld the banner of orthodox Marxism, but in practice, it adopted a passive, abstract and sterile attitude of holiday speechifying. Now, Marxism claimed he was trying to make Marxism conform to reality. In fact, uh, it was a plausible theory at the time, though it's been repeated many times since with uh, decreasing plausibility. But uh, Marx's prediction about the impoverishment of the working class had been apparently falsified by the continuing rise in their standard of living. So his theory of the ine inevitable collapse of capitalism, Bernstein argued, was falsified by capitalism's continuing expansion and strength over a whole historical period. For several decades, there'd been uh, more or less uh, smooth uh, development of, uh, of the economy and uh, no major wars. Um, and um, so therefore he said that the theory of the inevitable collapse of capitalism was, was, uh, was uh, made redundant by capitalism's continuing expansion and strength. And uh, what Bernstein argued was, quote, what is generally referred to as the ultimate aim of socialism means nothing to me. It is the movement itself which means everything. In other words, the struggle for reforms was uh, the pinnacle of what could be achieved by the labor movement. Now, this ideology, as I said, was widely shunned as a heresy, but it could be regarded as only a more explicit and transparent manifestation of the actual practice of the orthodox leadership of the international. Because the socialist international went through a period when its leaders, Kautsky and Babel, continued to defend Marxism in words against, against this growing reformist uh, trend led by Bernstein, representing a rising generation of party careerists. But in practice, they paid only perfunctory lip service to Marxism, while in practice pursuing day by day moderate practical goals. It was an early manifestation of centrism, a stance midway between reform and revolution. Now, of course, there was also a, uh, a very vigorous left wing within the German social democracy. The militant left wing was led by such towering figures as, of course, Rosa Luxemburg, but also Mehring, Jogiches, Karski, Radek, Clara Tetkin, 
and soon joined by the younger Liebknecht Karl. Rosa Luxemburg's life, let's just uh, take a, a moment to, to, um, to reflect on that. It represents a perfect combination of theory and practice and create in, in that she created classic Marxist literature and at the same time threw herself body and soul into the struggles of working people. She was a gigantic presence in the labor movements of Poland and Russia and Germany. It was Rosa Luxemburg being closer to the fray of the intimate inner party debates in the German party who had proved most alert to the coming danger. And yet together with her comrade Karl Liebknecht, she too had underestimated the mortal threat posed by the tendency of Kautsky and the leadership to accommodate and to conciliate the reformist wing. And like so many great revolutionaries in her lifetime, Rosa Luxemburg was reviled, slandered, exiled, jailed, and of course, soon murdered. And after her death, she became transformed as so many others have into a harmless icon, her role grossly distorted and misrepresented as a supposed enemy of the Russian Revolution. Of course, it's true that she expressed secondary theoretical differences with aspects of Marx's economic theories and some practical objections to aspects of the Bolsheviks' practice. But these were products of that fertile creative spirit, which is common to all genuine revolutionaries. Rosa Luxemburg honorably upheld the spirit of party democracy, as did uh, Trotsky. And I would like to give one quote from, from Rosa. Marxism does not consist of a dozen persons who have granted each other the right to be the experts, before whom the masses are supposed to prostrate themselves in blind obedience, like loyal followers of the true faith of Islam. Marxism is a revolutionary outlook on the world that must always strive towards new knowledge and new discoveries. Its living force is best preserved in the intellectual clash of self-criticism and in the midst of history's thunder and lightning. Those are golden words, which of course are uh, well remembered uh, by many people in many situations uh, since that time. And of course, she talked about history's thunder and lightning. Rosa was to see plenty of thunder and lightning before falling victim as a martyr to the murderers of the pre-fascist uh, Freikorps. Now, where did Lenin and the Bolsheviks stand along this spectrum? Did they represent, as, is, as they are often um, uh, portrayed, an alien tendency? Far from the commonly accepted caricature, painting them as bloodthirsty fanatics hell-bent on civil war, they considered themselves nothing more than orthodox mainstream socialists. They were representing the traditions of Marx and Engels against what was generally accepted as the deviant rebel strand of, uh, of Bernsteinian reformism. The name Bolsheviks, of course, which meant the majority faction within the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, that party was simply the Russian counterpart to the Social Democratic parties of Western Europe. And as its leading figure, Lenin considered himself nothing more than the local counterpart on Russian soil of Babel and Kautsky in combating these, uh, these reformist heresies. And again, I'd like to give a, a longer, longish quote from Trotsky, because it's important to, uh, to put in context the role of, uh, of Lenin in this uh, struggle. Trotsky says, Kautsky at the time was to be found fighting against Bernstein. Lenin considered Kautsky as his teacher, and he stressed this everywhere he could. In Lenin's work of that period, and for a number of years following, one doesn't find even a trace of criticism in principle directed against the babel kautsky tendency. Instead, one finds a series of declarations to the effect that Bolshevism is not some sort of an independent tendency, but is only a translation into the language of Russian conditions of the tendency of babel kautsky And Trotsky went on, Lenin wrote in his famous pamphlet, Two Tactics, in the middle of 1905, when and where did I ever call the revolutionism of Babel and Kautsky opportunism? When and where have there been brought to light differences between me on the one hand and Babel and Kautsky on the other? The complete unanimity of international revolutionary social democracy on all major questions of program and tactics is a most incontrovertible fact. Now, as Trotsky said, Lenin's words are so clear, precise, and categorical 
as to entirely exhaust the, the question. And just one more quote from Lenin in December 1906, we are not creating a special Bolshevik tendency. Always and everywhere, we merely uphold the point of view of revolutionary social democracy. And uh, again, in Trotsky's words, Lenin compared the Mensheviks not with Kautskyism, but with revisionism. Moreover, he looked upon Bolshevism as the Russian form of Kautskyism, which, is in, which in his eyes was in that period identical with Marxism. Now that, of course, changed very, very, very sharply. That explains the especially intense outrage with which Lenin fulminated against Kautsky's later overt disdain for revolutionary policies and demolished his arguments, for instance, in State of the Revolution. But Lenin had, at that point, trusted the leadership of the international. He was shocked to the core by their betrayal of 1914. But he had prepared the way for the tasks of the future by building a disciplined structure capable of withstanding the coming shocks. Now, no one is immune from mistakes. They play an indispensable and essential role in scientific progress, and if anything, even more so in scientific socialism. Up to the outbreak of revolution in 1917, the formula of Lenin and the Bolsheviks was uh, incomplete, algebraic, as Trotsky put it, on the tasks and goals of the Russian proletariat. That's a matter for a future discussion, which I think we're coming to uh, very soon. And Trotsky's formulation, the permanent revolution, was to prove more accurate. And yet Trotsky nevertheless recognized without hesitation his mistake in remaining detached from the Bolshevik wing of the party. Like Luxembourg, he had not anticipated the catastrophic historic consequences that were to blight future generations of what still remained mere inner party theoretical debates. And one more quotation from Trotsky. Uh, when he was really explaining how he came to make that mistake, and it applies equally to uh, Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky said, revolutionary centralism is a harsh, imperative, and exacting principle. I thought of myself as a centralist, but there is no doubt that at that time, that is the time of the 1903 split with the Mensheviks, I did not fully realize what an intense and imperialist centralism the Revolutionary Party would need to lead millions of people in a war against the old order. Independently, I still couldn't see Lenin's centralism, he said, as the logical conclusion of a clear revolutionary concept. In the midst of the still vague moods that were common in the group that upheld the East banner, Lenin alone, and with finality, envisaged tomorrow, with all its stern tasks, its cruel conflicts, and countless victims. So, Going back to the uh, to the Second International, suddenly in August 1914, out of a clear blue sky, the terrible 20th century suddenly exploded all around them. As late as November 1912, as the storm clouds of the coming World War were gathering, 550 delegates from 23 countries had assembled at an extraordinary International Socialist Congress at Basel where the Socialist International unanimously warned the ruling classes of Europe. Let the governments remember, they said, that they cannot unleash a war without danger to themselves. Let them remember that the Franco-German War was followed by the revolutionary outbreak of the Commune, that the Russo-Japanese War set into motion the revolutionary energies of the peoples of the Russian Empire, that the competition in military and naval armaments gave the class conflicts in England and on the continent an unheard of sharpness and unleashed an enormous wave of strikes. It would be insanity for the governments not to realize that the very idea of the monstrosity of a world war would inevitably call forth the indignation and the revolt of the working class. The proletarians consider it a crime to fire at each other for the profits of the capitalists, the ambitions of dynasties, or the greater glory of secret diplomatic treaties. Now that, if you like, was a, was a warning to the ruling class, be careful. What, uh, if you go to war, what, uh, what mayhem uh, could be unleashed? But in a way, they still did not actually believe that such an outcome was, uh, was likely. By now, the Socialist International constituted a formidable force. Its membership, if you take just the four main belligerent countries in the war, uh, Germany, Britain, Austria, and uh, France, 
the, um, its membership in those four countries alone amounted to, in Germany, one million plus, in Britain, one and a half million plus, in Austria, 150,000, in France, 90,000, in fact, totaling not far short of three million organized members. The total votes for these four parties alone in recent elections amounted to over seven million. It would have taken a single bold united call for millions to have been rallied to the cause of peace and solidarity. But the Socialist Party leaders had largely discounted any serious threat of world war. As they put it, it would be insanity without recognizing the insanity of capitalism. The Austrian socialist leader Adler, for instance, commented, if such a crime were committed, it would be the beginning of the end for the criminal's own power. The French leader, Jaurès, who was assassinated on the very eve of the war, reminded the government that, quote, in conjuring up the danger of war, they invite the peoples to make a simple calculation. How much smaller a sacrifice a revolution would involve when compared with the war that they are preparing? So the final statement of the Socialist International at a special conference, uh, that special conference in Basel, while remaining formally speaking consistent with the earlier Stuttgart resolution, uh, which I um, which I hadn't mentioned, but which uh, which was a more clear warning in the in the earlier years, but it shrank from the rhetoric of its ringing declaration. It just reminded the ruling powers that they could should not forget, quote, that they would be unable to start a war without endangering their own position. It would be madness for governments to lose sight of the fact that the very prospect of such an abomination as a world war would be enough to provoke the indignant hostility of the workers and drive them to revolt. Let the capitalist world of exploitation and mass murder be confronted by the proletarian world of peace and international brotherhood. Now, despite the ringing resolutions, with the ink hardly dry on their declaration, Again, that the capitalists, that the proletarians consider it a crime to fire at each other for the benefit of the benefit of the capitalist profits, the ambitions of dynasties, or the greater glory of secret diplomatic treaties. When it came to the issue, the British Labour Party entered the war government, the Belgian and French socialists joined coalition governments, the Australian Labour government supported the war, and of course, the German, along with the Austrian and the South African socialists, supported their governments. The international was shattered. Only the independent Labour Party, some Russian Mensheviks and social revolutionaries and Kautsky gave half-hearted opposition to the war. But of course it was left to the Bolsheviks, the Spartacists in Germany and a handful of Eastern European allies to maintain revolutionary opposition to the war. Once war had been declared, as I said, practically every one of the leaders of the socialist parties had crumbled and capitulated miserably to their kings and generals. Victor Adler of Austria wrung his hands. The war is already with us. There is nothing further we can do. The German party spokesperson justified, this is from, this is his speech actually in the Reichstag at the time. He justified supporting the Kaiser's war credits on 4th of August 1914 with this uh, little speech. We are faced now with the iron fact of war. We're threatened with the horrors of hostile invasions. We don't decide today for or against war. We have merely to decide on the necessary means for the defense of the country. Much, if not everything, is at stake for our people and their freedom, in view of the possibility of a victory of Russian despotism, which has soiled itself for the blood of the best of its own people. It is for us to ward off this danger. In the hour of danger, we shall not desert our fatherland. We feel ourselves in agreement with the international, which has always recognized the right of every nation to national independence and self-defense. As soon as the aim of security has been achieved and the opponents show themselves ready for peace, this war should be ended by a peace which makes it possible to live in friendship with neighboring countries. Guided by these principles, we shall vote for the war credits. After less than two years then, all the rigging promises of a Europe-wide general strike against the impending imperialist war were thrown into the dustbin. And almost to the last, the Social Democrats of all the belligerent countries swallowed their speechifying and tamely swung into support behind their kings, generals and ministers, tamely voting war credits to the Kaiser and the other respective combatants. And the news of this capitulation 
an outright violation of this solemn and unanimous pledge still ringing in their ears came as an utter shock even to those who had been most critical of the socialist leaders. The capitulation of the German social democracy on that day, August the 4th, was absolutely and entirely unexpected. Lenin, for one, was incredulous. The issue of Vorwärts, the German social democratic uh, newspaper, containing the patriotic declaration of the social democratic faction, was taken by Lenin to be a forgery per perpetrated by the German general staff. And he assumed that the newspaper reporting it was, uh, was a fake. So immediately on the outbreak of war, all the major socialist parties in the belligerent countries had issued statements justifying their support for their respective ruling classes. The war actually effectively it split the international not into two factions, but into three. The pro-war parties and the central powers, the pro-war parties of the Triple Entente, and the various very few and sparse anti-war parties, which encompass both the pacifist and the revolutionary currents. And it's impossible to find words which do justice to the indescribable dimensions of this betrayal. It was an act of immeasurable cowardice and treachery, directly plunging two successive generations, numbering tens of millions, into the worst horrors of what became, in effect, a new 30 years war in Europe, blighting and overshadowing all subsequent history. history. <clears throat> the Socialist International had died on the outbreak of the First World War, when its leaders had abandoned their internationalist speechifying and started cheering their members on in slaughtering one another by the millions on the battlefields of Europe. The workers once again were left without an international at the critical hour. Instead of uh, debating across the floor of a conference hall, they were peppering each other with bullets. Amid the blood and horror of world war and on the eve of a world revolution incomparably greater than that of 1848, they were left leaderless. And once again, in the dark years of the world war, the international existed only in the method and the perspective of a handful of cadres. So summing up the experience of the Second International, Lenin wrote, the Second International was an international organization of the proletarian movement whose growth was in breadth at the cost of a temporary fall in the revolutionary level, a temporary increase in the strength of opportunism, which in the end led to the disgraceful collapse of this international. It had been, in fact, the very successes, the growing influence and authority of the socialist parties that had blunted their, and softened their sharp edge. How was it that the Russian labor movement, so much weaker and more isolated than its central European counterparts, proved so much more capable of rising to the challenge? And I think the answer is its kaleidoscopic ingenuity, its improvisation and flex flexibility that equipped it for the tasks ahead. And Lenin put it this way. Bolshevism, which had arisen on this granite foundation of theory, went through 15 years of practical history, 1903 to 1917, unequaled anywhere in the world in its wealth of experience. During those 15 years, no other country knew anything even approximating to that revolutionary experience, that rapid and varied succession of different forms of the movement, legal and illegal, peaceful and stormy, underground and open, local circles and mass movements, and parliamentary and terrorist forms. In no other country has there been concentrated in so brief a period such a wealth of forms, shades, and methods of struggle of all classes of modern society, a struggle which matured with exceptional rapidity and assimilated most eagerly and successfully the appropriate last word of American and European political experience. So the workers once again were left without an international at the critical hour. Amid the blood and horror of the world war and on the eve of a world revolution incomparably greater, as I said, than, than that of 1848, and on the scale not of a single city, but actually raging throughout the continent, they were left leaderless. Once again then, in the dark years of the world war, the international existed only in the method and the perspective of a handful of cadres. Yet the cause of the working class will always inevitably reassert itself. Once again, more forcefully and insistently than ever, and far sooner than anyone could imagine, the phoenix was about to rise from the ashes. And that will be the, uh, the content of the next uh, discussion. Thanks, comrades.
Brilliant comrade. Thank you so much, Roger. That was a really inspiring and rising <laughs> speech. So thank you very much. Uh, to think that you wanted to pull out because you weren't prepared enough. No, it, it didn't show at all. Very, very good. Thank you, comrade. Um, if anybody has a question, I would like to make a comment, please. Can you click uh, raise hand under reaction? Um, I'm going to start asking you a couple of questions or uh, comments. I think it was very interesting. I mean, you focused on the SPD in particular, and I think that's that's quite right. It was one of the key um participants, one of the key parts of, of the international, and you described how the SPD was a real workers' party, a real party of the working class, dealing with every single issue, organizing in every locality, dozens of newspapers, national, local, regional, etc. It was it was a real um party of the working class. And then of course it did, it was one of the first to, to collapse in the face of imperialism under those strains. Um, it's interesting you mentioned I had 7 million, you know, across across Europe or the across the international, you had about 7 million members who were part of those countries involved in the war. And that had they pulled their weight, had they organized strikes, et cetera, against the war boycotts, it could have quite possibly, you know, defeated the war or at least led to a revolutionary situation in their own country um, that could have stopped the war or, or, or challenged it at least. And this is the, um, in 1912, you mentioned the, the, you mentioned the Stuttgart conference of the international, which, which was hugely important and which still confirmed the, the internationalism really saying, and it sort of, it sort of tried to formulate what we perhaps would now discuss as, or call revolutionary defeatism, doesn't it? The main enemy is at home, not quite the main enemy is at home, but the revolutionary defeatism aspect. Um, just a little quote from that saying that it, that it called on, it called on the members in, in the, in the countries, in all the countries to utilize the economic and political crisis created by the war to rouse the masses and thereby hasten the downfall of capitalist rule. So this, this idea of revolutionary defeatism, um, do you think that was quite developed then already at that time? And did most of them believe that that could be achieved through, you know, strikes, et cetera, to, to stop something like war? Oh, well. <laughs> I think, um, well, it, the lessons of uh, of that time are uh, they they hold just as uh, just as true today as they ever did, and the um, the the dangers of um, of opportunism, and uh, also uh, its converse, alternativism, equally spell really uh, a threat to to the very cause of the working class. Um, uh, I'd, I'd I'd rather comrades come in with more uh, maybe questions and points of discussion, and then perhaps I can take them up. There aren't any yet, <laughs> so <laughs> okay, yeah. be shy, perhaps. <laughs> please click right. Oh, carry on, Tina. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Ian's got his hand up, but I was going to mention the um, which always makes me chuckle a little bit that a, a few months before the war, Kautsky developed his theory of ultra imperialism to me, which is the idea that capitalism will sort this out you know there's no chance of war there's going to be an agreement between the leading forces um in the capitalist forces and you know there's no no chance of war happening that was literally like weeks before world war one broke out and you did highlight quite um interestingly the the, the you know the dynamic there that some some of the leaders pretended there was no chance of war happening while others like Rosa Luxemburg, I mean, there's this fantastic film, I, I urge comrades to watch it by oh, um, yes. Pontrot, um, describing her and showing her, you know, at all these conferences throughout this period, she bloody knew, everybody bloody knew what was happening, the, the rise of imperialist tensions, you know, it was so obvious at the time that this would, something is about to happen, something was brewing. A little bit like we're witnessing with, with witnessing now, wasn't it? So the crumbling of the British Empire, the rise of the German sort of industry and capitalism, and you know, a clash was clearly coming, but that the leaders of those parties, 
you know, almost made up this theory so not to get not to get involved. Uh, and this is a really it's a really fascinating um, film, and I urge comrades uh, to watch it. I think it's just called Rosa or Rosa Luxemburg, yeah. and it, it does show that is the is this bullshit. You know, it was just the assassination of of. You know, if you learn in Germany, if you learn about First World War, you'll be told it's the assassination of um, Franz Ferdinand that led to the World War One. <laughs> nothing to do with empire, nothing to do with imperialism. It was just, you know, uh, there was something brewing a little bit, but you'll never learn about the, the politics behind it. And you quite rightly explain how that then led to the Second World War uh, as well. OK, we've got a couple few comments. I'll just say, uh, uh, just, for, just endorse what you said about that film. The film of Rosa Luxemburg, it's, it's amazing. And you see, if you like, you get to meet not just Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, but all the figures of the time, you know, from Mehring and Kautsky and Babel. And uh, it's just and it, it it is just brilliant. Mm. It is. And it's very entertaining as well. It's a bit long, parts, but and you can see, um, you know, she was in prison for a long time and that gave her a lot of space to write and stuff. So it wasn't, you know, it, Probably not the worst uh, uh, period to to be in prison in that in that sense because she was, it gave a lot of opportunity to think etc. Um, okay, Ian is in first. Oh, he's in the garden or something. Yeah, it's greeting uh, right. nice. some greeting some sunny Durham. Um, <laughs> evening comrades. Um, the question I wanted to ask really was the extent to which I believe. Uh, Lenin underestimated just how corrupt uh, the Social Democratic Party in Germany had been, and just how, um, well, it, it's, it's, it's wrong even to say that the Labour Party was corrupt in Britain. It, 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 there wasn't a, there's hardly a grain of socialism in it. And from that point of view, it, it does seem then strange subsequently that Lenin is urging people to join these parties. Um, in left-wing communism and infantile disorder, which has often been used to, as, a, as a stick with which to beat the beat Trotskyists. Um, it's actually completely false to, to do that. Uh, in, in fact, of course, Lenin was arguing against people like Panico, Gorta, and Sylvia Pankhurst. But I, I personally believe that, that Lenin didn't understand just how bad things were. And in urging people to join um, social democratic parties of one sort or another, um, that really it sowed the seeds for what then followed was a was it was decades of class collaboration. Um, I'm not attacking Lenin for that. Perhaps it's understandable that he could have held that view. Um, but I think we have to, if we want to do any honour to Lenin's memory, we have to regard that as a huge mistake, don't we? That's my question. Roger, do you want to come in now? Yes, um, please. absolutely. You're you're right, but um, <laughs> you know we have the benefit of hindsight. The the fact is that uh, not only Lenin underestimated the the threat, so did Trotsky, so did Rosa Luxemburg. All it's true that Rosa Luxemburg was more aware <laughs> of the uh, the vices, if you like, of, of Kautsky, but she didn't prepare an alternative. One thing Lenin did is that despite his um, Despite the, the fact that he was not completely, um, uh, you know, he, he didn't see how far the degeneration of the uh, of the leadership of the social democracy would uh, would descend. But nevertheless, he built a Bolshevik um, tendency within the uh, Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, and um, we saw the results. And we saw the also equally we saw. The catastrophic um, uh, outcome of the fact that Rosa Luxemburg and the uh, heroic revolutionaries around her did not succeed in building in time uh, an alternative revolutionary party. Uh, of course, that came afterwards, but it came, uh, well, we know that the subsequent history we know. <laughs> Indeed. If, if I may just ask a, I'm sorry, a, a, one more point. Sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Ian. I, I'm going to say one, one other thing too. But um, after all, it was at the time one could understand that, despite all the all the points the comrades have made, you could you could understand that. I mean, even Bernstein's theories seemed, on the surface, to be um, plausible. 
because you know after all there hadn't been a war for decades there'd been continual huge development and expansion of uh, capitalism there'd been um, unbelievable growth of the labor movement they had all this had this all this you know, all the uh, attributes that i mentioned before all the achievements and so on and the idea that things would get better and better and i mean those ideas uh, i'm not saying that um it was not possible to see through them and people did see through them and um and they did not become the majority tendency even at that time within the german social policy. but nevertheless the idea you know they couldn't the, you know the idea that there could actually be the kind of bloodbath that we saw in two successive world wars with tens of millions um slaughtered and all the other horrors of the period um we have the benefit of hindsight to see that and of course we have to use the benefit of that hindsight to make sure we don't uh fall prey to the same mistakes uh, just as a supplementary if i may uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you i understand that, that it's all very well speaking in hindsight but in a sense there was a little bit more than hindsight going on um i have some respect for the council communists in one respect in that they could see the authoritarian tendencies that were growing within Russia. Uh, they could also see the fact that not only uh, were the social democratic parties corrupt, but the trade unions were corrupted. Um, they were usually then attacked for splitting with that, albeit whether you could say that was too late or, but I mean, but what, what we can't perhaps forgive is the fact that it continues to this day. Uh, you know, Liebknecht was shouted down on the grounds of unity. Uh, you know, somebody issuing the most clarion call was, was, was shouted down because he was seen as the splitter, when in fact he was the one consistent with, with the Marxist perspective, and yet he was the one who ended up being shot, and the people who had him killed ultimately ended up having uh, engaging in trade relations with the, the, the Soviet Union by 1922 in the Treaty of Rapallo. So, yes, it's we can learn a lot from hindsight, but th there was there were people who understood it at the time, but who were shouted down. It's just it's uh, one of life's great tragedies, I suppose. Well, I can only agree with you. <laughs> well, opponents of World War Three don't get a brilliant reception at the moment either, do we? <laughs> That's not not an entirely different situation. That's true. That, I mean, until until um, really very recently, the idea that we could have another World War would seem oh, just um, come on, unthinkable. We, we're, we're in modern times now. We've gone beyond all that, and um, I don't think many of us. Um, feel so sure of that now indeed and yet no sign on the horizon of a, of a third into a fourth fifth sixth international which is so desperately needed i mean there are these lash-ups in the oh, european we're doing our best. <laughs> we are this is part of doing yeah. something like that it's small when you were at, uh, up to 100 people in the audience which is pretty good that's definitely uh, um, uh, of interest to comrades thank you ian um john please Yes, well, well, thank, thank you, Roger, um, for, for that that exposition. It was very informative, and uh, it, it, largely my points are along the same lines. Questions, as much as anything, but it it was clear to me from reading the debates within the the Second International, such as they were, that there was a growing emphasis on safety, on playing things by ear, on the parliamentary road to socialism, as keeping things cool, alliances with the trade unions, making sure you don't outrage public opinion by um, anti-nationalist um, uh, rhetoric, etc. So that uh, appears to be, to be clear within it. And associated with that is that emphasis on downplaying the self-activity of the working class, working class struggles, controlling them, making sure that the, the trade unions and the parliamentary parties, particularly the S, S, SPD, had control of, the, of those emphasis. What it, what it seems to me also to, to suggest is what you've referred to as, in some ways. What were the theories behind that? Because as, such as they were, I, I'm not clear about the theoretical debates, because you have referred to the sort of orthodoxy of the collapse of communism. 
which appeared to be generalized, you know, ex the expo expose of, of, of Marx's theory as it with Bernstein, particularly re relating that to the study of capital. He wanted to abandon the study of capital as outdated because in his interpretation of that volume one of capital, it talked about the collapse of communism, which he saw was not going, going to happen by, by itself. Now, that seems to me to be quite a fundamental feature that underlines the, the politics and the theory of, of the Second International, that notion that socialism was inevitable, that there was a, a it was a determined uh, feature that you, you had to go through these stages, and that's largely associated with, with theories uh, uh, emanating from Engels as well in scientific uh, socialism and utopian, that somehow socialism was going to result whatever you did, um, so you had to educate the working class, uh, passively teach them what what was going to happen with, with it within the, the capitalist system and build upon that. But it was something that was going to occur regardless of the activity of, of the working class about that. Now, I just I just wonder, you said it yourself that, um, you know, it, it was the orthodoxy within the Second International the that capitalism would collapse. And, and Rosa Luxemburg had, had you know, adopted that theory as well. I'm just wondering how important, I don't adhere to that, and I don't think it, it results from any study of Marx's capital, but how important do you think that notion of the inevitability of, of, of socialism emerging from capitalist society had on the impact of the politics and the eventual collapse of, of the Second International as regards the politics? Thanks, John. I think, the, uh, I think you put your finger on it. I mean, that, that is... The, the the fact is that the um, all the the um, incipient corruption and then not incipient but quite uh, developed corruption that existed that, that developed within the socialist international um, had its theoretical expression in the idea that after all we're getting there we're making progress socialism will come uh, and the idea of revolution must have seemed um, uh, sort of bizarre. Must have seen. I mean, to to these uh, reformists, to these to these um, uh, well-heeled bureaucrats within the within the labour movement. Of course, I hadn't mentioned, but of course, um, there were plenty of material perks that um, that um, buoyed up the reformist theories of um, the leaders of the social democracy. They were corrupted. They were they were bought off. But they also the, the point is that they could get away with their their um reformist ideas because on the surface it seemed to uh to correspond with reality of the workers were making gains they were getting you know and uh, the war came as as tina said it came as a complete shock even though even without all you know all the ringing resolutions and declarations and threats and uh and warnings from the uh the successive uh conferences of the socialist international uh despite that the workers and the ranks and even the leaders didn't actually believe that it was ever going to come to that um so what does that mean the need for theory the need for study the need for a revolutionary attitude towards um towards the development of a, of a proper revolutionary cadre does that answer your question, John? Sort of. <laughs> well, I yeah, can't yes, better. answer everything, but <laughs> yes, yeah, so, sorry, better than better than I thought. I thought I would, I would have some points to disagree, but I tend to agree with what he says. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, Anne is next, and comrades, you know, even asking a question is totally fine. Don't feel shy about it. Hi, Anne. Hi. Okay. So I disagree with a lot of what's been said about the Second International um, because I've come to understand and study it more in recent years, particularly because of the work of Mike Tabor. I don't know whether comrades have read his book Under the Socialist Banner, which is a complete, um, a complete set of resolutions from the Second International. And that will show you that it wasn't the case that there was some orth genuine generalized ortho orthodoxy within the international that 
um, capitalism was going to collapse inevitably. No, it was a struggle between the Marxists of the international and others in the international, particularly the British um, SLP and the Fabians. Um, yes, some in the Germans, but I would say that actually the Germans in general, um, except for um, Bernstein, um, would have had a very, you know, how can I say, a Marxist orthodox um, approach to questions. So you see from the very beginning that the Marxists and the organized um, parties were in conflict with the fact that there were um, trade unions in the international and that always created a conflict and a contradiction within the international. So to me, I think that that was one of the key contradictions in it. Like Mike uh, Tabor describes it as a parliament of the working class. And, uh, you know, it's often been said that it didn't do any of the things it agreed on. And it was like, I, I suppose I think that that was in its nature, really, because of the difficulty of doing so, because of the um, fact that they had um, Labour Party. Yeah, they had Labour Party, but they had trade unions in it. And also, of course, more right wing forces. But there were fierce battles went on within the international. Um, Actually, Mike Tabor is bringing out this other book, um, which I'm reviewing at the moment, is hopefully going to be out soon. And this title is Reform and Revolution. And I've been reading some of the debates, which show that there were fierce arguments like between Babel and Jaurès in France over Millerandism, um, fierce debates between Kolsky and others. Yes, of course, you can see that Kolsky tended to conciliate, um, but it wasn't just one, one tactic, you know, he would be pulled back by his own comrades towards a better position. The other thing about the international that perhaps you weren't aware of is that there was a women's organization, which was part of the international, the Women's Secretariat, which was set up by Clara Zetkin in 1907. And there were two conferences in 1907 and 1910. And then indeed, after the war started, there was a conference in Bern in 1915, which was organized by Zetkin and um, which was a women's conference, but it was it was advertised as a peace conference, but it was the first conference, anti-war conference within the international, which then led to other forces coming together in a more organized way. But in fact, the women's women's section of the second international was one of the most militant. Again, they had to deal with many issues um, of, you know, arguments with reformists, but they're, they're probably the, the most prominent battle was around uh, universal suffrage. And you can read them, you know, basically um, arguing that they wanted to use the fight for a vote in a revolutionary manner and that they, you know, it wasn't the call for universal suffrage because they, they opposed the Fabians and others who um, argue that the that, that you know they would that they would fight for the feminists as one step forward you know for um, limited suffrage. I mean, you should read Clara Zetkin's. I don't mean I I accept obviously comrades haven't had the opportunity, but I have had to read this. But I think there 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 are a lot of um, materials even on Marxist.org that you can look at to see which will show you the battles that went on. Even from the very beginning, you can look at the writings, the reports of, um, of Eleanor Marx and the battles that she had with, um, again, the Fabians in the international. So I think that the international is an, ex what is an extremely important historical experience that we need to study. And it's not, you know, a, a simple question of, you know, everything being accepted as going in the right direction, you don't need to intervene. The arguments for socialism and the, the arguments, I should say, for revolution, like, you know, are repeated right through it. So it was a battle. And at times, the, the Marxists did win. For instance, and I'll finish here because I know I've spoken for quite a while. There was a fierce battle over immigration and the um, American um, participants in it in particular were very anti the um, 
importation of what they called like unorganizable labor. I think it was particularly the Japanese and the Chinese that they were against anyway. So there was a fierce battle with them and um, the left won on the question and they ended up with a far more progressive position on immigration than we have on the left today, where basically they, they were calling you know, for an end to all immigration controls, but for migrants to be organized alongside the working class in the country that they were coming into, for them to receive the same benefits as other workers, and um, for them to be organized from the minute they like left the shores of their own country um, and received into the organizations of the country they were um, entering into. So like some really, um, like just some really interesting stuff there. So, you know, like, obviously I have disagreements. I'm not going to go into any detail on them, but I suppose my main thing is that it's a very complex um, experience that we need to learn a lot about. Oh, just one final, final thing. Sorry, Tina, I disagree with Ian on leaving it. I think Lennon was right. I think the others were right to stay with it. And then, you, I mean, you can see when it comes to the German revolution in 1919, the mistakes that were made of not continuing to orient towards the organized working class. I mean, the working class was, the, the international and the German SPD was the representative of the working class. And you had to stay there and fight within it. And I think that they were right to do so. I don't know. Yeah, look, I won't carry on, but there, I, I also don't agree about them not expecting the war. There were there were plenty of skirmishes happening, and there were there were discussions, and there was a resolution. I think actually you referred to it, Tina, the resolution that said that if in the event of a war, you know, this is what we're going to do. We will you use the opportunity to um, um, turn our guns on our on our um, rulers, and so within that, I think you're right that you can see. This is, I think, where a number of um, SPD speakers were particularly good on this question, that you could see the development of the idea of, um, of um, what do you call it, uh, of Lenin's position um, on, on turning the war into revolution against your own. So I, I think that that's interesting because you can see that this wasn't something that just came out of Lenin's head, but it was an idea that came out of the debates within the, in the within the international itself. And anyway, thanks for giving me the time. Thanks, interesting, uh, and you might have to come back and do a <laughs> fuller uh, session on this one. <laughs> I was going to precisely suggest that I think you should have had Anne uh, giving this uh, introduction instead of me, because she's studied in uh, chapter and verse and line by line, the debates <laughs> in the international, and that's really interesting, and thank you, Anne, for that. But I would say, Yes, no doubt they had furious debates, but um, we saw the outcome when it came to it. The, so the Socialist International was not prepared uh, for, for the war. And uh, even though it's true, I mean, in, in the uh, resolutions that I uh, quoted, if you, read, if you read it carefully, there weren't um, threats of revolution. There were warnings of revolution, which is not quite the same. There were not... There were not it didn't tie them to say we will declare well they did say, sorry at one point they did say we'll declare a general strike a worldwide general strike and uh, that but that was just words but actually the, the don't you know the the the, the um, resolution at stuttgart that i sorry the stuttgart conference which was a couple of years earlier was much more uh, graphic uh, because uh, precisely because it was earlier and it wasn't actually on the eve of the war the um, the Stuttgart, uh, sorry, the Basel resolution um, is actually more measured. And it says, uh, you know, how could you do a war? Can't you see what will happen? Can't you see that it would mean such and such and such? And such? I read out the, um, the, the script of it. And it was more or less saying, well, there can't be a war. Come on, it's ridiculous. Because uh, it would, uh, it would, they wouldn't be stupid enough. I mean, that, that's kind of the, the underlying um, uh, idea behind this. So anyway, and the point is, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. When it came to the war, for all the fine words and the speeches, say the holiday speechifying and all the rest of it, when it came to it, what happened? They fell in behind their masters. Um, 
Yeah. Hmm. Interesting though, um, when, when Anne was speaking, it did, um, the idea of, you know, turning the war into revolution, it's, uh, is of course what happened to end the war, isn't it? Sort of that you had to have, I mean, especially the German, German um, um, officers wanted to push on and push on and basically throw, you know, dead people after dead people and, and just continue the war. And you eventually had mutinies in various areas. And they said no. And that, that sparked then the revolutions as well as in Russia, of course, in Russia successfully, in Germany, and unfortunately not, um, but Bulgaria, etc., and all these, you all these um, soldiers who said, no, we've had enough, and not only have we got enough of this war, we also have enough of this system that sent us to war, and we're going to overthrow it now, and that led, obviously, that had a, 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 to the a revolutionary upsurge in, in 1918, 1919, interestingly. Um, Will, please. Hi, yeah, I, I found what Anne was saying really interesting as, as well. And I think indeed another session looking at that because what really struck me about what Roger said was uh, that the, the first thing was that, that how shocked Lenin was when he, he, he thought he was reading a forgery, when he, he read the declaration of, of the SPD and that tells you a lot about uh, what Lenin understood about what was going on in German socialist politics, actually, um, that this was just inconceivable to him. And it, it just seems to me that there's a, there's, there's a kind of a, there's that, that space that Anne was talking about, to some degree anyway, between the kind of anti-war line and the bureaucracy that collapsed into a war line and the debate in the space in between that I think is really really important to understand and I know actually very little of it and I, I thought what I was saying was fascinating what what I was also wondering was in terms of okay you can see uh, you have a mass uh, workers party with the bureaucracy and people have material gains that they wish to defend and they don't want to attack capital because uh, they want to defend their material gains within the bureaucracy, yeah. And you can see what you can see the material foundations for a whole layer of these bureaucrats to support war from their own country, yeah. Um, what what I don't know about, and would be interested to find out about, and I don't know whether Roger or anybody else watching knows about this. Is is are we are we then saying that the working class as a whole went over to war? And what was going on in terms of the, the political education inside these mass socialist parties that made that possible? That not only the leadership, but the greater part of the working class uh, stood behind their own ruling class. So what was going on there? Um, and the other, the other thing that, that, that strikes me about the discussion and, and people were mentioning, you know, the, uh, the possibility of a third world war. Um, it's not just it's not the case that you have a you just have a bureaucratic interest that will make you pro war. Uh, there are some people who regard themselves as finely educated Marxists who are now, in my view anyway, uh, supporting an imperialist war. Um, you know, an inter imperialist war and they've taken a side in it and these are small left or revolutionary organizations who don't have you know. Uh, the bureaucratic privileges that, that, that were in the kind of German social democracy and other places, yet they have flipped over into supporting an inter-imperialist war. Um, and, you know, that has to say something about the nature of Mar the, the nature of the kind of Marxist theory that people have been working on hitherto in terms of they're able to turn everything on its head and suddenly become in favour of an imperialist war. So there's something else to think about there. But just to return to my original point about um, the working class in its majority supporting the First World War, what, why does Roger think that happened? Why weren't there greater levels of resistance? Or were there, and we just don't know about them, as Anne was suggesting? Uh, well, I mean, as you say, we all, we could all see without, without um, a strong leadership, on behalf of trusted and um, uh, established, um, you know, uh, workers, uh, workers, leaders, then people are prey to the bombardment of uh, propaganda by the ruling class. 
And of course, uh, it was easy in that situation for the bureaucracy of the of the socialist parties to get away with their stand. But you always see in any war um, at the beginning, the ruling class is able to whip up support among their among their subjects. But in the course of the war, it turns against them, and in, and the that's what broke up the um, the old social democratic parties. Um, I mean, I agree with everything that Will says, but um, I'm afraid that's that's the way that I mean, you can see how the mass of the population are always going to uh, be miseducated and deceived and fooled by the propaganda of the ruling class, which is bombarding them in, at every in every moment of their waking life and even their sleeping life within the in the in the press, in the in the um, in the media, in uh, the speeches, in in every kind of uh, way, um, they're able, particularly perhaps even more so today with the mass uh, media. Um, but um, the lesson of what happened is that that doesn't last, and that reality um, imposes the need for a, a recognition of um, of the truth. So I mean, I think, as you say, we see. I mean, the um, recent event. I don't want to start a discussion on on Ukraine now, because uh, you know we, that could uh, lead us uh, into a very different territory. But we have seen how socialists have become completely disorientated, just um, on both sides. So if you like, uh, in both directions uh, by the war, that rather than rather than taking an internationalist position um, of um, of uh, opposition to the war and opposition to the uh, to the ruling classes of both sides, we see um, how how people so easily and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not comparing myself to Lenin, but Lenin was shocked. I'm shocked by some people that I know who've um, who've suddenly adopted the most uh, ridiculous um, pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist pro arguments, and I'm talking about on both sides of the conflict who've not been able to to uh, take a, um, a, a simple, clear, internationalist, proletarian, uh, anti-war position. Yep. And this is not. I don't. I don't think this is a diversion. To be honest, this is. We are going through a stage which is not unsimilar to what socialists went through over a hundred years ago. It is the same build-up, as you say. It's clearly there's an inter imperialism, you know, going on. The U.S. versus Russia, China, etc. It seems pretty clear to us. And yet you raise any of that. You make you you're a Putin apologist, or you're a, you know you're a anti-Semite, of course, we've got all of that that going on. But clearly the 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 lesson of of that uh, experience, the main enemy is at home that goes for us here as well as for people in Russia, for Russia, for Russians, of course, it's Putin it was their main enemy. I beg his belief that some people believe they have to support somebody who is keeping his own you know people prisoner and uh, you know is is a total dictator an anti-working class dictator just as for us here you know the our enemy our main enemy is british capitalism british imperialism american imperialism they clearly we can oppose all sides and you know stick with the international working class is the only class that has no desire to pursue such such a war. How then? I mean, it's a few a few um, comments in in the in the chat there, and we've had no more people with their hands up. How how can the the working class? How do you see this this struggle? You know, is is the main enemy at home revolutionary defeatism? Is that still a slogan we should advance today? Absolutely. <laughs> That's an easy answer. <laughs> I mean, we we have to expose the the truth about about uh, the war. I, I I mean, I'm reluctant to get into, uh, you know, a discussion on the Ukraine war because we've had that discussion and we have more, and I'm I've got a lot to say about that. But I think it would divert attention a bit. Mm. Well, we're <laughs> as... the past war, as Ian says, yes. Mm. 
We've got um, Mark now who wants to come in. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? All right. Um, <laughs> war. Uh, I spent the whole of my life uh, in various shapes, forms and fashions, arguing with mates, people I've met, people who are friends of mine, neighbours, uh, lads I go to the football match with who've been uh, military men. Um, Peter from Sunderland and from County Durham and uh, people in West Yorkshire now and how dispiriting it is to uh, persuade uh, people that going to war on behalf of those people who rule over them is really not something that any decent person should should consider. Um, what's amazing when speaking to so many people is the stories that they will off the record tell you of horrible things that they're actually being involved with and things that they are embarrassed about. And the ruling class is aware of that. Uh, obviously, it propagates a, a, a line on a daily basis in the newspapers, but by introducing the Official Secrets Act, it prevents such people speaking out about what they've actually done and undertaken. And that makes it easier for other people who, in truth, actually know that there has been that people do commit uh, grand atrocities on behalf of the British state, but that keeps it secretive and open. And the Labour movement per se during the time I've been actively involved has rarely carried out anything like energetic campaigns to try and break down the Official Secrets Act. And so as a consequence, the, the real stories are never told, are, are they uh, really? Uh, it, that's a great, great shame uh, it, 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 as well. Uh, in terms of the First World War, I, I just wondered at a small point, is, it's often been said that the uh, ruling class also welcomed the First World War because it was a period of great industrial strife in their own countries, in Britain and in Germany and other places. I don't actually necessarily agree with that I think but I think there is a is a point to that there was mass movements wasn't there taking place amongst workers and workers were winning largely inspired by uh, uh, syndicalism I haven't really answered a question I've just posed a few of my own uh, uh, per personal personal thoughts my best friend uh, recently died actually who was a military man and one of my absolute heroes because uh, being a Catholic boy, he was placed in duty in uh, West Belfast and absolutely absconded and uh, was uh, was interred, well, sent to prison down in Colchester for, for six months. So, um, and I must say, I really deeply miss him as it happens, uh, but he certainly would and never would and never did despite my real efforts Get him to go on the record about exactly what 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 had happened, and that wasn't because he wasn't a courageous man. He demonstrated that doing the the Canio situation at Sunderland, where he went onto the television and denounced the fact that we had a fascist as a football manager, and received numerous uh, death threats. Was advised to leave Sunderland, and we basically calmed that down by telling people he was a former military man. So. We used that on that particular occasion. Anyway, I'll sure up now. So, thanks for your time. Thanks, Mark, and condolences. Very interesting. Very good. Yeah. Mm. The, the the army and the, the the role of the army and the police is clearly one that that we as socialists have to take seriously and try to split them and win parts of it over. As happens, of course, in revolution. In revolutions, parts of the army tend to to go over to the working class, if not the the majority. So it's an imp important point when we're discussing war and, and revolution, et cetera. Um, Georgia, we've got no more comments now from the from the floor, no more hands up. Do, would you like to like sum up what, what lessons can we draw, the key lessons for you from the second international perhaps for today? Well, 
Oh, what do we what do we say? I mean, the whole of um, our lives now have to be devoted toward building an international, a genuine mass party of the world working class. And uh, that is coming. I think that the the point is that the working class has shown again and again. I mean, we've we've already discussed the uh, the the first international, well, in fact, even the pre-international of the um, Communist League, the first international, the second international. Now we're about to be discussing next week the um, the third international. Somehow or other, you know what uh, Marx's thing, old mole. Uh, which um, is buried under the ground, but it uh, that it hugs its nose up and uh, appears again, and that's what that's what happens to socialism and to the uh, to the working class movement. Now, the first international came firstly on the initiative of the London Trades Council of the British working class, which was actually the first really the first industrial working class uh, in the world was based in Britain. Also to, uh, to, to, to um, almost to the same extent by the French uh, working class. The second international, as we discussed today, was built largely around the growth, as I, as I explained earlier, of the German party, of the German working class, and the huge uh, progress that they made in self-organization. The third international, obviously, was created as a byproduct, if you like, of the Russian Revolution, and it was based on the, in other words, mainly on the heroism of the Russian working class. Where's the next uh, international going to be built? Where is the biggest, the most organized and strongest uh, working class in the world? Organized, I'm saying, not in terms of their politics now, but uh, organized in terms of industry and beginning to flex their muscles industrially. It's in China. The Chinese working class has, is very much like the Russian working class. It's um, in a generation, um, people who were working on the soil in quite primitive conditions, in a generation they got transported in Russia into the most advanced um, modern uh, factories in uh, Moscow and uh, Petrograd. And uh, they became very quickly, they took to struggle and very quickly also open to revolutionary ideas. The Chinese working class is the same, multiplied, if you like, um, many times over. I think uh, we're going to see the new working class developing. And there is a new working class, in, in a sense, also developing in the West. Not the old industrial working class has gone. But look at the proletarianization of other layers of the working population. There is, there is um, you know, now we can bar uh, we can we can almost uh, count. Uh, never mind nurses, but doctors. Never mind, uh, never mind um, taxi drivers and, and um, uh, courier uh, uh, couriers and fast food workers and so on, but also um, barristers and university lecturers and so on. They're all entering into industrial struggle. There is. A working class is, is developing. The working class is uh, stronger or more powerful. For the first time in history, the working class is actually a majority of the world population. Mm. Uh, so all this discussion of uh, the international is not just um, academic or, or uh, of historical interest. It's the lessons that we have to learn from the history of previous internationals for the new international, which we must all... Uh, help to build today. That's Absolutely. All. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade. I was going to men mention this, that we're in a much better position, objectively at least, today, in that there is officially, yes, a majority in the world population that is now proletarian. I, it's, you know, it, it has to sell its labor power. It has nothing to lose but its chains. It is not a small peasantry anymore, etc. They have, you know, they 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 are literally have nothing else to sell but themselves, which which does make it a more give it more potential as a revolutionary force. So that puts us objectively into a better position. Subjectively, of course, we're in a bit bit of a problem in terms of the 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 state of working class organizations, not just in Britain but but worldwide. Not sure about China. We'll we'll find out. Probably, I mean, this is a massive dictatorship as well, which which of course Russia was as well, and yet yet the working class um, 
built itself into you know the, the Bolshevik party was led into the, by the Bolshevik party and perhaps perhaps we we, we see something similar very thoughtful um very good pro thought provoking um comments there and uh, a very interesting discussion comrades but loads of people in the audience up to 100 uh, just under 100 um coming and going so um we're trying to get mike Tabor for next week if he can do it then with you've got a week's rest and we're postponing the third um international by one week but uh we'll let comrades know and we'll let you know roger if you got a week break but thank you very much fantastic discussion fantastic evening see you soon comrades bye-bye thanks comrade for a very stimulating discussion too it really was thank you